Hello, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Voyages of the Snowy Owl with Dr. J.F. Terrien, Hawk Mountain's Senior Scientist and Graduate Study Director. Hello. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so much for your continued support. We could not do what we do without you. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges, and we are thrilled to offer our community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. And we've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Dr. J.F. Terrien is joining us today to teach us about the beautiful and fascinating snowy owl. And before we get started, I'd love to share some of J.F.'s background experience with our audience. J.F. grew up in Sherbrooke, Canada, about 30 minutes north of the border with Vermont. He was an academic trainee at Hawk Mountain in 2002 and holds a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in biology. J.F. is the senior scientist and graduate study director at Hawk Mountain, where he works on various aspects of raptor conservation science, including satellite tracking of peregrine falcons, turkey vultures, snowy owls, rough-legged hawks, as well as monitoring American kestrel breeding populations and monitoring of North American migratory raptors passing over the sanctuary. Wow, JF, your academic and professional uh, scientific background is really impressive. What inspired you to become a scientist? Hmm. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Jamie, for uh, hosting and, and, and inviting me. Uh, well, I think it all stems from, from uh, just general curiosity. I've always been curious about the natural world and trying to understand it and trying to protect it. So uh, it just kind of flow and then it just went in and, and being at that I want to learn about all those things. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. So let's travel back in time to 2002 when you first arrived at Hawk Mountain to be an academic trainee. What drew you to Hawk Mountain back then? Oh, that's a good question. I actually, uh, I was conducting, uh, I was doing my bachelor degree and doing an honors thesis. And again, that same curiosity, I was uh, engaging with professors in bachelor degree in my classes. And so I was asking a lot of people, hey, I want to get involved. I want to study birds of prey, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know about Hawk Mountain at the time, but one of them, one of my professors, knew the staff here, the research team, and say, well, how about you reach out to them? So I did and came in and, and did uh, an internship, an academic traineeship, uh, which, uh, during which I studied broadwing hawks as they migrate over Pennsylvania. And then I travel with the broadwings to Costa Rica to study them, the, the behavior, migrati migratory behavior of broadwing hawks uh, at two different locations. So that was a big hook for me. And I was, uh, I've, I've been uh, doing this, this work ever since. Wow, what a great story. And so much has happened since then. And we're so glad to have you on our team. All right, JF, I'm gonna turn it over to you. There's a lot of people that wanna know more about this awesome bird. All right, well, thanks so much. And thanks so much for joining. It's a pleasure for me to talk about snowy owls. Um, it's, it's an easy topic for me. Uh, it's a passion for sure. And of course, I send the link for this, this um, meeting or conference to a lot of people abroad. So I don't know if you're joining from Norway or Alaska or elsewhere in the US and Canada, well, I'm say, saying hello to everyone. Um, now I'm proud to be uh, part of this team and 
as you'll see during the presentation, I'll just start it in a second, but all that we do actually is a collaborative work. None of it is possible by just one person. So while, while I'm, I'm wearing my, my Hawkman shirt, I want to remember other organization which with, uh, I'm working with. And as, if you have seen me presenting before, you know that I'm, I'm trying to acknowledge every one of them. So here's my shirt for University Laval. So of course I started as a PhD student, but now I'm a colleague and still working with the folks in Quebec and Canada. So uh, I want to acknowledge the partnership that we have with people up in Canada. Now everything, all of it is actually uh, linked to the bird. So our main goal has always been focused on the bird himself. So that's why my next shirt is actually a snowy owl shirt where this is actually why we do all this. We want to protect those guys. We want to make sure they uh, thrive and be there for generations. So uh, this actually, this is a painting from a, a colleague uh, that we have in Norway. There's a young birder that actually paints and draws bird. And um, he did a nice snowy owl and then they used it, the Norwegian team used it for, for a t-shirt. So I'm proudly wearing this t-shirt and, and um, trying to share my passion for snowy owl. So let me share the screen now. So there's a, a couple of videos in the PowerPoint. So if um, you're downloading at the same time, uh, other videos or, or having a lot of stuff running on your computer, I've heard that it probably is better to have uh, as few as possible so that the video that I'm going to show runs uh, well and lightly on your side. So, uh, but let us know if you can see them. If you can see them, like Jamie was saying, this presentation is going to be available on YouTube afterwards. So I'm here to talk about the voyage of Snowy Owl. Of course, uh, voyage sounds a little French. Uh, I cannot uh, hide the fact that my French accent comes from north of here, where uh, Snowy Owl is the actual the, the emblem, the national bird for Quebec. Uh, where I grew up. One of the things we want to do with the whole study on Snowy Owl, but that actually um, is the same, the same framework we have for every species. We want to base our knowledge and our study of those species on long-term monitoring. We want to assess the vital rate, which is survival and reproduction. Um, we want to do, we want to study and assess population size. We want to know how, how many they are, how well they survive, how well they reproduce. We want to know the population trend. Are the populations increasing or are they stable or are they decreasing? All of that put together, none of it, none of it actually is possible without the long-term money. So this is a key component of what we do. Now, we also are highly interested in the movement ecology. of the world. We want to know where the birds are at what time and why. So we want to know what triggers movement, what trigger uh, selection habitat, what trigger prey um, selection, and and what makes um, what are the, the birds basing their, their decisions on. And lastly, the last thing we want to do to, to uh, have a holistic view is to assess what we call the ecological neighborhood. We want to know how the species we're studying are interacting with the other species in the ecosystem. So at Hawk Mountain and elsewhere, but we uh, especially do it at Hawk Mountain, targeting tough predators allow us to have that holistic view. Because when you use those uh, tough predators, you, uh, you know that those species are reacting to uh, the whole food web. So by knowing how the tough predators are doing allows us to understand the, the ecosystem as a whole. Now back to Snowy Owl. <clears throat> well, to study Snowy Owl, this is a global map of where Snowy Owl occur during the breeding time. Uh, well, it's not a map that you, you used to see, but it's actually a map that we're looking from the top down. So from the, looking at the North Pole and around it. So this is a circumpolar world. And it's a huge area. It's a huge, uh, broad, continental, uh, circumpolar scale that we're trying to understand what is going on with Snowy Owl. Population, like I said, population size, population trends, survival, and reproduction. Uh, we have plenty of partners, but as you'll see in the coming slides, it's a challenging thing to do up in the Arctic. It's not easy to access the breeding grounds. There's not a lot of people over there that can combine and help and provide information. So we need a, 
get all the tools we can to assess how are the snowy owl population are doing. Now, again, the partners, well, uh, Université Laval has been a big partner in it. I want to highlight Gilles Gauthier uh, on the left of the screen. He was my PhD, PhD advisor at the time, now a colleague of mine. And the, the other picture shows uh, the field crew for uh, that year. One thing you can notice on all those pictures is the smile on, on those people. So a bunch of principal investigators, grad students, field assistants, everyone's pretty happy to be there. It's a beautiful landscape to be uh, working in, and it's just, you, you cannot help it but smile when you're up in the center. I'm happy to be partnering as, as well with other uh, organizations, Project Snowstorm being one of them. Again, this is a from different backgrounds. We have vets in the team. We have uh, people interested in the trapping and the winter ecology and, and so on. And we have the people designing the transmitting, the transmitter that we use on the birds on the team. So it's a very, uh, very efficient and collaborative team, team that I'm lucky to be part of. Uh, as well, we have the broader international snowy owl working group that we, um, that gathers people from around the world uh, that are actually conducting studies on snowy owls. So uh, those are meetings that we have every three years. Uh, last March, just before the whole pandemic happened, we uh, gathered in Northern Norway and uh, it was a fifth such meeting where we actually share observations, share results, discuss about uh, what needs to be done in the future and how to do that. So it's a very efficient team again, uh, seven countries represented. Uh, the two pictures show the same people and you can see the aging, how, how well we've aged over time, but basically it's a very nice group, very dynamic uh, group with, with uh, who we were. Now, I mean, I cannot say enough of the partners we have up in the North, uh, working with Inuit communities, is, is an amazing experience in itself. Learning so much from their uh, history and, and, and their knowledge about the land and the ecosystem, and they share with us. So we're trying to work collaboratively with them. We're providing uh, results from our studies. They're providing a knowledge that they have gathered over time. And there's a nice exchange of cultures and knowledge, and it all sums up to, to the passion we share for those animals. Uh, I think I have a picture. This is Terry, um, a high school student. So we hired um, in local Inuits to work with us to learn how we conduct science, how um, we are coming from way out to come and study the land and the ecosystem, which uh, is where they actually grew up. And they, they, are, they have a, a special fondness to it. And they learn from us how to apply scientific research and study design. So it's a very it's a nice win-win situation when we can involve uh, the local folks up in the Arctic. Now, this is a, an image of what the breeding range looks like in North America. So it's a huge habitat, a huge uh, broad uh, landscape, which looks pretty much like this. So this is the Arctic tundra, typical Arctic tundra. There's no tree. There's a, you can see far away in the tundra, which is one of the things I, I like the most. You put a scope up, or binoculars and you can just scan around and chances are you're going to see stuff because birds are doing their day-to-day -day things they're far away but they're still they don't feel like you're too close and they just go on their business and it's just a fascinating place to sit. One of the main herbivores in the tundra are the lemmings those are uh, about the size of a vole or red bag vole that we would have here in eastern North America. They're a little bit, a little bit, little bit more chubby and adapted to the cold but they are the main herbivore there. And one particular aspect of their biology is that they show those huge fluctuations in abundance from one year to another. One year you got plenty, and I'm hoping you see the, my, my uh, mouse right here, but you have peaks in abundance, and in between you have those low abundances. Now the reasons for that are still being debated, but one thing we know is that snowy owls are um, lemming specialists. They eat lemming 95% of the time, especially during the summer, and they mirror what we see. So when there's a lot of lemming, there's a lot of snowy owls nest on the island. So of course there's some noise in the data, but basically when there's a lot of snowy owls, lots of lemming, 
there's a lot of snowy owls that come, settle, and nest on the site. So this is Hawk Mountain on the map. This is where the study site is, 73 degrees north. Um, right now, and as it is in, in the summer usually, it's 24 hour daylight. So the sun never sets, it just circles on top of your head and it's bright sunny almost all the time. Um, people ask me, well, how, how, how do you get there? This is, uh, you cannot just drive up there. So uh, just to show you quickly, but we use all sorts of um, plane rides from big commercial airlines to, as, as you move north, the, the planes are getting smaller and smaller until you need to get uh, an, an helicopter to hop on the, on the site. And the site where we work, actually, I should have mentioned it before, but it's uh, the, the long-term study site where we work. It's a national park, and Parks Canada have been a key player in the whole study as well. They've been a very nice collaborative team to work with, and they allow us to land in uh, Tong Inlet, which is the Inuit community, and then we conduct the work on the island of Bile. This is what it looks like. This is the Inuit community at the forefront. Uh, you see the houses and the landing the, the strip for the airplane. And you see the channel. And then on the background, those are the big mountains of Violet. Where the main camp is, is on the flat plain on the left side of your screen. And I think I have a picture. So this is a typical habitat with a mix of wetland and drier land up, uh, up the hill. Raptors typically nest in those higher elevation or drier land, they will be seen uh, hunting down in the meadows and the, the wetlands, but they're gonna be nesting up, up the hill. So just a quick, uh, I have a quick video of what the field, like, uh, the field site look like. Um, I don't think you can hear the music, there's music associated with it, but uh, I don't think the music is on. For you. Yeah. I'm gonna just narrate what is going on on, on the screen. You see all sorts of nice birds over there. Um, some of you that know birds, you know already the king eiders, the red throated blue, no geese. All those birds are nesting at the same time, which is actually right now. It's uh, a little sad this year with the pandemic. The field site has been city of Kendall. So there's no one over there to witness the long tailed dogs. Oh, yeah. Bears, tent pipers. On the train. It's uh, one of those satellite camps that we use to cover broader regions to improve places. This after dinner city, the Pakistan. Either again, I feel a tension. This Arctic pattern, Hotel Jaeger, Jaeger. So we use the helicopter mostly to move place to place, but sometimes we conduct some of the raptor surveys from, from the helicopter. Big playground, we have uh, Baron Falcons as well. Falcon chick, Ruffligus. They grow super fast. Um, then most of where we can tell, we're, we're walking, we're hiking to net size, net size, and up. we are
So all of those pictures, of course, are taken when it's nice and sunny and beautiful, but sometimes we have surprises. This is from last year, 23rd of July, a blizzard came in and we woke up, it was covered in snow. Um, we had a good laugh about it, um, but it melted uh, quite quickly. Uh, we also need to make sure we are aware that we're in polar bear country. Um, every year we see um, we have a sighting or two, but none of them are at cloud close encounters and uh, nev nothing never ever happened in the past. So uh, we're very cautious um, and we use um, an electric fence around camp, but basically the bear have learned to avoid humans and humans have learned to uh, not be in the path of uh, polar bears. So um, just to show a picture of what it looks like. This is a typical snowy owl's nest. So top of the hill, with a big commanding view of the surroundings. You see the chicks, uh, the down of the chicks in, in the nest. Uh, this is a picture that shows the difference in ages. So you see in the, in the middle, there's a very tiny one that is much smaller than the oldest one. And there might be an egg as well on, underneath all of them. So they have a huge, it's a, an asynchronous uh, hatching uh, schedule. So the first, um, the female incubates the egg as soon as she lays them. So the first one to hatch might at some time might be two weeks older than the last one to hatch. So there's a huge difference in size in snowy owl chicks. That's a researcher waiting snowy owl chicks. And then they get bigger and, and meaner and, and they're hungry. And we use all sorts of tools to uh, learn more about them. So this is a camera trap that we set up in front of nets and we can record the prey delivery. We want to know how many prey are brought back to the nest to feed the chick and the female. We use as well satellite telemetry. So we uh, put satellite backpack, tra uh, satellite transmitter or um, new GSM transmitters on the back of the birds and we track them over time. And most of the, the maps I'm going to show you guys comes from the tracking that we've done over the years. So after we release them, we want to know where do they go after nesting on violet. So if violet is represented here on the top of the screen with this pink uh, circle, and let me just compare to what most birds usually do. So a typical annual journey for an Arctic nesting species is to nest at one spot, to fly down during the, during, uh, the fall and, and winter at a given spot, and then return in spring. So they do that on a, period a periodic, very fixed schedule where they nest and winter at the same site every year. They go back and forth. They try to be as direct a line as possible because it cuts on, it cuts on uh, the time they're vulnerable. It cuts on the energy requirement to fly those long distances. So usually you see that kind of pattern for, for several species. This is, for example, it could be applied to a snow geese. And then back again. Now, snowy owl in the first uh, fall, we expected them to come down south. From previous knowledge that we had, if they breed where the arrow is, which is violet, we thought, well, in the fall, they probably come down south. So we were not surprised to see some of the track birds coming down south. Um, so each one of those lines represent a bird that we've tracked. And over time, well, we, we've seen all sorts of different patterns. This is an example of two birds. They nested as neighbors. They were right next to one another during nesting season. But then in the wintertime, they actually split out and were far apart. They're both females. Uh, one of them went to um, Newfoundland. The other one actually ended up in North Dakota for the winter. So huge differences in the migration routes and the wintering sites. Now, even more surprising, the same year we track additional birds, and some of them, instead of coming down south, actually move up north. So if you put yourself in that situation that this is uh, winter up the Arctic Circle, it means that it's 24 hour darkness, and the birds are still moving towards the North Pole. So we were mind blown by this, seeing that actually Snowy Owl kept on moving apparently doing fine because they survive and bred every year after that. So very interesting behavior, like they don't need to come down south like we expect all of them to do, uh, some of them moving north. So uh, the other result we have from additional birds we track 
most of them actually came down south, but they all remain north of the tree line, almost north of the Arctic Circle. So they use the Arctic habitat a lot more than we thought in the wintertime. Now, if we look at the spring movement, one of the things, those are the same birds I've shown the fall movement. Now they're all there for the, the spring migration. One of the things I want to uh, raise the attention on is the wide difference in movement in individual babies. So the red one, they're all female, they all bred successfully the year before. So there's not a big difference in age or sex or whatever. They all, they all have a similar background. One of them wintering in North Dakota, traveling thousands of kilometers to end up in Western Canadian Arctic. That yellow one actually stayed around, moved around, zigzagged a lot, and actually settled to nest the next year. So why diversity in behavior? One of the key words I wanna, I'm going to come back with it that describes snowy owl movement is the zigzagging. They do that. They go back and forth, east, west, north, south, all the time. They are looking for something. This is spring movement. And like I said before, lemming population reach peak in abundance is most, most roughly one year out of four at a given site. But it's quite unpredictable, and especially for Snowy, to know where to go to find an abundance of food. So they actually are driven by those lemmings, but they don't know ahead of time where it's going to happen. So they need to do this zigzagging, the searching, we call it prospection for lemmings. So they, go, they travel wide distances to, to find a place where lemmings are numerous. So now, after a full year, this is the kind of thing we see. Um, this is only 10 individuals. It already looks like a bowl of spaghetti. They all crisscrossing. They all go any direction. And they show wide differences in movement. So very localized, the yellow one, and very uh, broad range uh, movement of the, of the red one. The next summer, after they all bred under the star here, so this is Violet Island, they were all neighbors. The 10 female were neighbors nesting successfully on Violet. The following year, compared to most birds that tend to go back to the same spot, none of them came back, and they all settled across a huge area up in the Arctic. So we had birds in the Western Arctic, and most of them scattered across Baffin Island. We were lucky that year to be able to go and confirm that they were all breeding on those, those, that year as well. And they were doing so at a huge distance. Like I say, usually most birds tend to go back and breed on the same places because they're familiar with the place. They know it works. But snowy owls don't do the same. They, they're, they're not the typical birds. They actually uh, are looking for a place with lemmings and they're going to just move wherever they are and settle there. So, the mean distance from one year to the next, 700 kilometers. This is much higher than any other birds that we know of in terms of where they bred one year and with where they bred the next year. So a huge distance is among, uh, between two consecutive nesting attempts. And on those places, we were lucky as well to be able to go and to confirm that they were nesting and there were a lot of lemmings on those sites. So very fascinating behavior that we um, were only speculating about, but now the transmitter, the transmitters allowed us to be able to show that and witness that in real time when, when it was happening. Now again, I'm just gonna show a few more maps, but this is a picture again for that second spring. Now, after they did the whole year, we kept tracking the birds for several years. And again, I wanna show the wide diversity in, in behavior, in distance, uh, that the birds have traveled and in the places that they've settled. So that red one again did huge travels. We had the yellow one staying up north actually bred up on Greenland. And then look at this orange one. So starting here where it wintered actually ended up here to settle and breed. But look at the pattern to get there. This is not the closest way, the shortest way to get there. So they actually zigzagging looking around, trying to find a place where lemmings are numerous. And when they found such a place, they settled in that. So over four consecutive years, we had tremendous variation in, in places that the birds have settled. But what is striking the most is the distance between those nesting attempts, huge distances 
that was never recorded in any bird before we did that. that study. Now, what we are starting to find out when we partnering with uh, other researchers, we have colleagues in the prairies of Canada and the Great Plains in the US and they're tracking birds as well, same technology. And they're tracking the birds from the wintering ground. So the wintering ground are here in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, across the Dakotas and some parts of Montana. And what we see is that the zigzagging occurs once the birds cross into the tundra. When they're south of the tundra, when they hit the tree lines and the boreal forest, they switch to highway mode. And it seems to be, there seems to be having some sort of a snowy owl highway just on top of the tree uh, of the boreal forest until they reach the Great Plains. We have um, other kind of behavior in the wintertime from Alaska and Yukon where the birds are moving uh, across Alaska, but not coming down south. They're actually coming down here, wintering here, sometimes crossing over to Russia and back. So it's, it's uh, very contrasting to what we see down in the eastern uh, side of things in the wintering time. Now, the, an even more fascinating aspect of snowy owl movement was the winter movement, per se, up in the Arctic. Um, if you look closely at the map, you see that the locations are actually not over land. Most of those locations are over the sea. So, I mean, snowy owls are not a marine species, or are they? They've been spending a lot of time on the sea ice. The one thing you have to know is that this habitat, this, this uh, landscape is covered, most of it, uh, with, with sea ice. And snowy owls seem to be spending a lot of time on it. But for what we knew, we didn't know they were doing this. And so we started asking the question, well, why would they do such a behavior? So this is a pattern for a bird for a full year after nesting northern Baffin Island, went all the way to the coast of Greenland, but stayed up there on the sea ice and then nested the next year on Ellesmere Island. Don't worry about the little yellow dot, but look at, this is the, the I put a sun, but it, this is the location of a snowy owl. So this is a typical map of what the, the habitat looks like in the wintertime. Most of it is covered with sea ice. This is a grayish year, and you got an island right here. So there's the mainland or an island and sea ice, but there's also a lot of open water patches. This is a darker grayish on the map. Uh, those open water patches are um, dynamic um, open water patches, they open and close, but most of the time they occur the same places every year. They're caused by uh, tidal currents um, and, and um, the weather and the topography of the land around it, and you have those openings in the sea ice. Most of the time when we look at where snowy owls are in the wintertime, they're actually right on the side of one such open uh, pollinia, open water patch. So the question that came was, well, what are they doing there? Are they, I don't know, dipping their feet or, or and actually when we start talking about it, well, we knew there, there's no lemming there and it's supposed to be a lemming specialist. Well, in the winter time, they are actually going to places where there's uh, a lot of seabirds like uh, eider ducks, long-tailed ducks, gulls actually gather and concentrate in those open water patches and they're feeding on the seafloor, on mussels and other things that they can find in the sea. And then while we were talking about this behavior, we thought, well, are snowy owls going for eider ducks? And when we talked about this, um, some colleagues of us say, that, that study uh, the eider ducks, they say, yeah, oh yeah, we see snowy owls all the time. They're actually feeding on eiders and they're, they're taking them when the eiders are, are resting on the ice. So the question that came was, well, can snowy owl actually take such a big prey, a nighter duck is even heavier than a snowy owl. But now when you look at the, at the feet of a snowy owl, this is, those are, are uh, closed feet, but when you open the talon, I don't, I don't suggest you guys do that because you don't want to be caught by a snowy owl, but when you do that, you see the size of their feet, they're about the size of your hand. And if you compare it with the size of a lemming, you realize that the tool they have is much bigger than the job they need to do with the lemming. So actually a picture is worth a thousand words, but this is a picture from the Great Lakes. This is a young snowy owl, one, not, not even one year old, that actually took a merganser from the lake and it's gonna go and snack on it for, uh, and it's gonna be able to survive on it for a long time. So 
they actually do that and they actually benefit or, or uh, are becoming marine or, or water predators in the winter time. So very opportunistic behavior, very fascinating aspect of their life history. We as scientists always like to put things in boxes and think we know, oh, this is the Arctic tundra and this is uh, the marine ecosystem. Well, there's a lot of exchanges between the two. So we need to know those, those links. I'm gonna wrap it up with, with some question that a lot of people are asking me about winter eruption. What is causing snowy owls to come down in the winter? And some years, if you have noticed it, some years we've got plenty of snowy owls in some, some regions and some and, and next year, the following years, we've got very few. So we're trying to explain or see what is the mechanism be, be, be behind the winter eruption. So when you look at the biology of a snowy owl, this is a, a clutch of snowy owl. If you count the numbers of eggs, there's a lot of eggs. That's a lot of future baby owls that can be produced by a single pair. The average clutch size for snowy owls is, is seven eggs. This picture shows a nest with 11. So it's possible to have all the way up to 11 eggs in a nest. When there's plenty of lemming, such as uh, this picture is showing, the male is feeding the female, bringing back food for the female and for the chicks. And when there's plenty of lemming, I mean, there's plenty of lemming. So this picture shows this nest that actually had only four eggs, but 78 lemming ready to be consumed by the female and the chicks. So it's easy to understand that all those ticks add all the food they need to reach fledging age and, and leave the Arctic tundra at some point. So this is a picture that can be taken in early or mid July. And this is a picture in September that you can see from the same kind of place. Several owls, owlets, ready to fly out, ready to go out and they're doing their own thing in the wintertime. So what happened is that it, it creates a surge in population. There's so many young youngsters and young snowy owls, and they invade and erupt in the south. This is a, a screenshot taken from eBird, and it shows a winter eruption. This uh, screenshot is from um, winter 2013-2014. It was the last huge eruption that we had in the eastern part of North America, and it's a fascinating phenomenon to, to witness. So that eruption actually triggered our, our team, the Project Snowstorm Partnership. So we got together a bunch of people that are passionate about snowy owls that uh, either trap them, study them, and, and have lab facilities to um, increase our knowledge about the eruption themselves. So by, uh, as well, because of the help, the help of the public, we were able to gather several pictures and several, I mean, hundreds of pictures. And we are charismatic, people like to take pictures of them. We are using the pictures to assess the age and sex of the bird. It's not an easy process, but looking closely at the, the molt pattern and the size and the number of bars that they have on their feathers, you can tell uh, an adult from a, an immature and a female from a male. So using that, we were able to say that in that huge eruption, 2013-2014, 95, 94 or 95 percent of the birds were actually young of the year. They were just produced the year before, the summer before, and they're actually just dispersing for the, for the first winter. So that explained mostly the winter eruption that we see. Now, Snowstorm has grown and hasn't stopped from just uh, collecting pictures. We have tracked with solar powered uh, super light devices the movement, the highly precision movement of the birds during winter and when they go back up north and come, come back south. So, uh, there's more to come on this uh, from a, a, with a different uh, presentation that's going to come in a few weeks by um, Rebecca McCabe. She's a PhD student working with us. And she's going to present about uh, winter movement and survival in the winter time. So basically, those transmitters allow us to be much, much more precise than ever before in their uh, their behavior, the location, decision, and the time resolution. So we can show landscape level movement across hundreds of kilometers to very localized movement. So this is a bird that's been going back and forth in the channel on the east coast, and you see the daytime. Um, locations are the reddish and the blue ones are the, um, the nighttime and now one of the things we see is very precise uh, resolution and as 
on this on this picture, one of the things that uh, struck us was that the birds seem to be converging all the time at this very point in the middle of the screen. And when you look closely at it, well, it, it's open water. So the question rose that, well, what is this? What does that mean? Now, since those transmitters are so precise, we can zoom in and see that there's actually a channel buoy over there that the bird is actually roosting and feeding on seabirds and gulls in, in the wintertime. So fascinating things that we're adding to the knowledge and it allows us to know more um, than we are adding. Now, well, we've all heard of climate change and well, climate change is happening. It's happening fast in the Arctic. Uh, this map on the right shows the places where the sea ice is retreating the most in the winter. And those are places in red on the map. So where it's red, it's where sea ice is retreating. The thing that is of most concern right now is that those places are places where we usually see snowy owls in the wintertime. So those places are changing the fastest are the places where snowy owls tend to use to go usually. So we still don't know how this is going to affect them, but we know they might be uh, affected by climate change. Uh, elsewhere, this is a graph from Scandinavia. They've seen a fading out of the limbing cycle. So instead of having those high peaks in abundance like we uh, like to see and we used to see, they have uh, faded for 20 plus years for a long time. So for 20 plus years, they didn't have any peak in abundance of limbing and in turn, no snowy owl nesting. Now the lemmings peaked back, I think it was 2014 and again 2018, but for 20 some years, no snowy owl were nesting in Norway and our Norwegian colleagues were afraid that they've lost the snowy owl. So this is something we're keeping track of. We are uh, assessing lemming population as well in North America and the Arctic. And we haven't seen a fading out of those uh, peaks, but we are on the lookout to, uh, to assess. Now, this is a great picture. We, this is the kind of thing we want to see all the time. I'm not going to wear my pink glasses and only look at those. We need to recognize as well that, well, this is happening as well. With climate change, you got more, um, you got different players in the ecosystem. This is a, a snowy owl that actually was bitten by black flies to the point that her eyelids were clogged together. She couldn't see. And this is from Norway. So Norwegian colleagues of mine actually walked up to her and picked her up from the ground. She was about to die. They brought the bird back in rehab. Luckily, the bird was able to be released after treatment. But of course, uh, she lost her clutch because she wasn't there to incubate and, and brew the chick. But at least they saved the female, but it's still the, um, the black flies is a new player in the ecosystem. So we all haven't had to deal with black flies in the past, but this is the kind of thing, kind of changes that we see happening. So I'm just gonna wrap it up shortly. We are collaborating using all sorts of tools from genetics uh, to uh, movement ecology. We're trying to set population size. Now, back in 2012, um, from the red list, the IUCN uh, red list, Noel was uh, classified as the least concerned because of the population size. Now with new genetic work, we uh, realized that there's far fewer snowy owls than we thought they were, that they were. and then they revised the um, classification to vulnerable. Now we're still working on this and, and trying to refine those analysis, but we're working with them, with the partners in flight as um, a yellow watch species, and we're trying to uh, see the changes in population over time. We're trying to connect with everyone we can. We try to share a message, take information, and, and ask for people to join as uh, being citizen scientists. We have this program at Hawk Mountain uh, where we connect with people. Snowstorm is a great example as well where people can share their observations. Um, now, I'm doing my part. I'm trying to uh, raise awareness. This, those are my kids. Uh, we're banning screech owls because it's easier to get to a screech owl's nest than a snowy owl, but uh, by learning at an early age, you have that sensitivity and you care about the uh, natural world. So this is the thing we're trying to do. We have an amazing group of trainees, uh, both former, current, and future trainees, a mix of grad students. Uh, and then here, the, 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 this picture is from um, the conference last year where staff and grad students and former trainees and there's so many people that poor Mitchell had to be cut off of the picture, but we have a nice group of people still involved with us. 
this is Marianne. She's going to be talking about some of the genetic works that she's been doing. I'm just doing some publicity for, uh, and then Rebecca McKay is going to talk about winter uh, ecology of snow owl. So uh, her talk's not going to be in slow mo, but I think this video is pretty pretty cool to see her releasing a snowy owl in winter. So I think I'm going to wrap it up right here. And the main thing we're trying to do is to save those guys, to protect them for the long term. So thank you very much. Thanks for all the people involved, and thanks to you for watching. Thank you, JF. That was absolutely fascinating. And your photographs and your videos were absolutely stunning. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we do have several questions. Um, are you ready for questions, JF? I am ready. I can put a snowy owl in the background if people want to see it. I'm hoping it's not going to prevent you from asking questions. I will say um, we did get some comments when you were narrating over the other video. Um, it was your audio was cutting in and out a little bit. So okay. I don't know if that would happen again, unless it's just a, a picture and not a video. Well, I'm just, I, can, I can just say like that. That's okay. Okay, no problem. All right. So um, I think people really liked your t-shirt. And although you did show us several different wardrobe changes, that was wonderful. Um, is there any way that people can order the t-shirt um, to provide financial support to the project? Very good, very good question. I'm actually gonna ask, um, this is a uh, t-shirt that was made by the Norwegian colleagues and I'm gonna ask them for sure. I think they, uh, they, are, they have them for sale uh, in Norway, so I don't know if it's possible to get them here, but I'll definitely look for it. And should I reply to, where should I put the information if people wanna buy it? Um, that's a great question. Maybe what we could do is have it posted on the description of this, um, recording that will be posted on our YouTube channel. So that way anyone that views it on the YouTube can see the link to purchase and perhaps Perfect. on our website as well. Excellent. Fantastic. All right, next question. I realize these transmitters aid in knowledge, which is pretty impossible to do otherwise. Are you certain that they have no effect on the birds? What is the average time these transmitters stay on the host bird? That's a very good question. And this is something we, are very uh, cautious about. We want to make sure this doesn't affect the bird, but that's a very good question. And this is a question we ask ourselves all the time. We're about to deploy any of those. Now we've done tests with several species. Uh, I can just talk about the snowies, but basically we aim for a transmitter that um, is lower than 3% of the body mass of the bird we're tracking. So we have um, like a threshold that if transmitter is that big, it's not going to be able, we're, gonna, we're not going to install it. Now we've tracked those birds for several consecutive years and survival rate was so high compared to any other owl similar size that we um, realized that it doesn't affect their survivorship. We also noticed that the birds we track reproduce successfully every year. So it wasn't affecting their survival rate, their, their, their reproduction rate as well. So long story short, we uh, feel that those transmitters have a very, very limited effect, if any. Thank you so much. Okay, the next question is about the graph that you showed earlier in your presentation, JF, uh, showing the peaks in lemming and snowy presence uh, during 2003 and 2005. Um, so and there, the question is about the mismatch, um, that during 2003 and 2005, there was a mismatch, many snowies, but not many lemmings. Was that the example of the noise and the data that you mentioned? And do you have any theories that could explain that mismatch? Exactly, well, this is right on. Good job, guys. You could be scientists like, like, like with us. Um, all of that, all of the lemming assessment and snowy owl assessment has some noise in the data. So. Basically, we, it's, it's relatively easy to come up with a very precise number of snowy owls nests because they're so obvious. So you patrol, survey a given uh, study site and you can say how many snowy owls nests are there. Uh, now the lemmings, they're those small creatures that we are, are uh, trapping and putting a little ear tag or a little pit tag on them to assess how many of them there are. And this has some noise. So if the trapping sessions occur and then that year it was a big, it's a rainy year, we weren't able to trap them, but we know there's several. 
well, sometimes we're not, I mean, this is not perfect. So we know that year was still a good, I mean, a good year for lemmings, but the, the, the data doesn't show it. So if you want more information, there's some papers that explain this in very, in, in a lot of detail and I can't share them, but I want to be, I don't want to be too technical here, but this is a very good question. Yeah, great questions. Um, okay, next question. I'm guessing for those owls that are moving north during the winter and enduring 24 hours darkness, there is no way to observe them in person. Do you think those owls behave the same way as owls that migrate to places with more daylight? Or could there be differences in the way that owls behave in 24 hour light versus 24 hour darkness? Great question, guys, this is fun. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things we need to remember, the snowy owl can see quite well when there's just a tiny, bit of light. So if the moon is up, they can see quite well. Now for sure they're not going to feed on the same things because the, the species up north are not the same as down south. Most of the birds spending most of their time up in the north were actually associate, associated with the, the marine ecosystem. So they were going for, for uh, waterfowl, eiders, long-tailed ducks because they sat right next to where those species are gathering. But we've seen some spending a lot of time inland in the winter time. And we know of potentially two species that can, they can prey on, uh, one being the ptarmigan, which is uh, still active in the winter, and the other one is the Arctic uh, hare. So both species are potential prey, but there's very few people that have seen snowy owl in 24 hour darkness preying on land, animals. So it's still, there's still a lot of unknown with snowy owls. Sounds like some potential for some more research projects, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for the question. Very good question. Great questions. All right, here's another one. Do you track male birds? If so, have you noticed any gender differences? Great question. We um, don't see a lot of differences among, among sex on movement patterns. So the birds from the Arctic, um, most females stay up in the Arctic in the wintertime, the male that we tracked did the same. In, in the South, we're uh, using male-female uh, classification to see if there's a different pattern. It's not obvious a uh, difference. So no, we don't detect a huge difference among, among sex. Thank you. So um, there is a question uh, about uh, stemming from your kids, JF, that uh, the photo of them helping with the banding of the screech owls. Uh, someone is asking, is there any way that their kids can be involved in a project like that? Uh, or what, what opportunities are there for people that want to be involved uh, with owl banding? Well, the first thing I think comes from, I mean, depending where you live, but it to be, um, to look around and see what's surrounding you. And when you can provide a feature such as an, a nest box in the habitat, sometimes it helps a lot from bringing species that wouldn't nest in a cavity, but they can't do it because there's no cavity. So erecting nest boxes, it works for screech owls. If you put a box up, you might be lucky and get screech owls in. Now to be bending the chicks, you need to have a permit, so people can apply to permit, or you can connect with your local conservation organization. If you're nearby Hawk Mountain, connect with us, and sometimes we have opportunity to do so, and uh, we would be happy to involve as many people as possible. And I'd, love, I'd also like to add, we're starting to plan more um, member-only events uh, for, for scientific field excursions, such as, such as those special things you were just talking about. So stay tuned in future calendar of events for those opportunities for members as well. Um, so JF, one more question. Um, are there any other predators that really focus on and hunt the lemmings besides the snowy owls that are perhaps competition for the snowy owls? Great question. Um, the rough-legged hawk is definitely one of them. When there's a lot of lemming, uh, those are the years we see snowy owls, but then rough-legged hawks are more numerous and they're highly successful as well. So um, they're not as specialized on the lemming as the snowy, but the rough-legged hawk and then the arctic foxes are also preying on, on lemmings. And lastly, uh, some, some Jaegers, uh, such as the long-tailed Jaeger, are quite good uh, predators of lemming. So there's Competition is, is hard, is, is, is fierce, but snowy owl can uh, actually manage their way. And all of those predators have different ways and niche that they actually are the most efficient and they can uh, thrive even though the competition is that high. Thank you so much. And I feel 
we've gone through a lot of questions and great job audience. Those were some really top notch questions. I did want to mention about some future talks where you could learn more about the snowy owl. Um, uh, JF mentioned in his presentation, uh, he has two uh, graduate students he's mentoring that are working on snowy owls. So Marianne Goosey is giving a presentation, a webinar in our virtual program speaker series on August 14th. And she's focusing on the genetics of raptors and also including the snowy owl. So that will be really exciting. And then also on August 28th, Rebecca McCabe will be doing a snowy owl presentation again, focusing on her specific research. So we're really looking forward to that. JF, as always, you do amazing presentations. Thank you so much. And thank you to our fantastic audience for joining us today. Um, it means so much to us. We hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. And as always, we have several more virtual pr programs coming your way soon. So this is what's in the lineup. Um, next Wednesday, June 10th, we have Slithering Snakes at 1 o'clock p.m. Next Thursday, June 11th, we have Sanctuary Storytime, Percy the Victorious Vulture at 11 a.m. Next Friday, June 12th, we have Galaxy of Falcons with Scott Weidensall. On Wednesday, June 17th, we have PA Dutch Pow Wow with Porcupine Pat of the Schuylkill County Conservation District. And on Friday, June 19th, we have Learning Bird Song by Habitat with Holly Merker at 4 o'clock p.m. So lots of good things coming up. Thank you so much, and we hope to see everyone again soon. Bye for now. Bye, guys. Thanks.